You, you got it from there? Yeah, okay. Wow. I'm in like surround sound today. Hey, before we open up our time of worship, I just wanted to uh, say a couple words about Beth Paulus. She uh, went to the Lord to be with the Lord yesterday afternoon. Uh, so I just want to say a quick prayer for her and for her family. Heavenly Father, it's never easy to lose a member of the church. There's great grief. There's incredible sadness. Even though there's also the joy of knowing that she came to be with you, God. I only met Bev one time. Uh, over the phone, she said that, depending on her mood for the day, would tell her if uh, I was going to see her more than once, um, which was hilarious at the time, but um, really sad that I only got to have just a short bit of time with someone who this church valued so highly. Uh, I hear that she liked to sit in the front and she liked to be a part of the children's service, which uh, just tells me a little bit more about her and the personality that she has. Lord, it's with the deepest sorrow um, that I commend her spirit to you. And I just ask that, Lord, please be with her family, um, be with her three daughters and her son who are grieving today. Lord, I thank you for her life and everything it meant to everyone in this room, but also to many, many more people. Thank you for the gift that will always be Beth Paulus. In your name I pray, amen. So welcome everybody, welcome to church today. It's the first day of Advent, so it's a time of, of hope and just beauty. Oh, 
sing his praise aloud. Oh, awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise aloud. Awake my soul and sing, sing his praise aloud, sing his praise. Uh, at my church in Colorado, they used to say, instead of just saying stand, they used to say, please stand in body or spirit, uh, kind of allowing for that not everybody has the strength to stand on a certain Sunday, or maybe for a mom or a dad who has too many kids in their lap, they might want to just sit for a little bit. So please stand in body or spirit as we call ourselves to, into worship right now. We invite your spirit into this beautiful Advent season. Renew our sense of holy anticipation. Let us be those who are waiting eagerly for Jesus to come again. More than anything, we ask that you be glorified in this season of expectation. Amen. And now be seated, and I'd like to invite the Foster family up, or I think Brett and Megan. Uh, for the candle lighting. Morning. Today I'll be reading from Isaiah 9, verses 2, 6, and 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the deep, darkness a light has dawned. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and the peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Next is Hebrews 11 and 12, verse 13. Faith is the assurance of all things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By faith, we understand that the words were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain's. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, for whoever would approach him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. Therefore, from one person descendants were born, as many as the stars of heaven and as innumerable grains of sand by the seashore. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an... Oh, sorry. <laughs> by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. Insist that Christ be greater in wealth than treasures of Egypt, for when he was looking ahead to the reward. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she had received the spies in peace. 
Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance that race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. so much. Let's all stand in body or spirit uh, to sing hymn number 559, We Gather Together. Now let's come together in a time of confession. Father, just as you sent John the Baptist to prepare the way for Jesus, help us to clear the path in our hearts as well. Show us the distractions in our life that block us from all out worship of you this Advent. Lord, we await your coming. As we celebrate the first Advent, the first coming, we look toward the day where we will see your face to face. Give us a heart, Lord, that looks for your coming on a daily basis. Help me to live my life where we're constantly seeking your presence. We ask you today for a righteous life, for we know we can only be clean because of Jesus. Show us today how we need to be refined, purified, forgiven. Give us the strength to ask for forgiveness and the strength to change our ways. Let's continue in a moment of silent confession. And our assurance of forgiveness today from 1 Thessalonians 3, 
How can we thank you enough for Jesus, who in his death brings us the joy of forgiveness and a straight path clear to you? Night and day we are forgiven and receive a heart that can be blameless and holy in the presence of your God and Father. Thanks be to God. Thank you for the gift of your one and only Son. And now a time to pass the peace with each other. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. And hi, fist bump, whatever. <laughs> I long for a time where we can actually uh, give a peaceful hug or handshake, but here we are. And now usually we have a prayer of illumination at this point, but today I'm doing a declaration of good news. This is from a, a Christmas service uh, by Ellen and James Edgar. Hear the good news which we receive, in which we stand, and by which we are saved, that Jesus Christ was born, lived, and died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared to the women, to Peter then to the twelve, and to many faithful witnesses. We believe he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is our Savior, the victor over the powers of sin and death. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading today is from the book of Jeremiah. It's chapter 33, verses 14 through 16, and can be found on page 903 in your Bibles. This is what Jeremiah is saying with the Lord's voice. He says, The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. The word of the Lord.
that's the story I'll tell About the pieces together Made me the storyteller Now I know it is well It is well That's the story I'll tell You hold the broken You first time I heard that song. That was amazing. Uh, I love just that idea that we're all storytellers. That's, that's great. Thank you so much. Our second reading for today is from Luke chapter 21. It's verses 25 through 36. It can be found on page 104 uh, going into 105 in the New Testament. This is what Luke has for us today. Uh, He's quoting Jesus saying, There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth distress among the nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will faint from fear and foreboding of what is coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, stand up and raise your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. He said, look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know that summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So be on guard so that your hearts are not weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of this life. And that day does not catch you unexpectedly like a trap, for it will come upon all who live on the face of the whole earth. Be alert at all times, praying that you have the strength to escape all these things that will take place and to stand before the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. So I I don't have a whole Bible trivia for you all today, but I just have one question. What is Advent? What does the word Advent mean?
All right, I'm going to tell you, I'll give you the answer. If, if everybody's shy, I think you all know, but that's all right, a little shy today. The answer is, it's a time of waiting. Now, it's interesting, I kind of played a little trick on you all, because the last four weeks, we've been anticipating Advent. So basically, we've been anticipating more anticipation. <laughs> we've been waiting to do a little bit more waiting. But actually, Advent, a better description of what Advent truly is, is a time of preparation. So maybe a better way of looking at it is we've been preparing to prepare. Now, many of you might share this day that I had yesterday, which was a day of putting up a tree and decorating it and putting decorations around the house. It's a common tradition after Thanksgiving to start doing the Christmas stuff, right? And so we're preparing our whole house for Christmas time. So we're getting prepared. Now, what are we preparing for? Now, I'm going to say most Advent sermons, especially Advent week one, are going to start working in the beginnings of the gospel, right? And start talking about things like wise men and King Herod and shepherds. I decided not to do that. I decided to do something really quirky and uh, have a talk about promises and what we're waiting for, even as we're thinking about Christmas time. So I want to talk to you about the Old Testament and promises that God has made. I'm going to talk about five people or five times that God made promises that we all kind of know about, and then one kind of bonus one that I just think is very interesting. Um, so the first promise happens to Adam, right? Adam is promised this, this whole Garden of Eden. He's given sovereignty, almost like kingship over the garden. But he's more than just a king. He's also promised that he will take care of it. So he kind of has this caretaker, sort of gardener, sort of king role. And then he ruins it by doing the one thing God said not to do. God said, I'm going to give you all this stuff as long as you don't eat this one apple, right? We know what happens next, and Adam is pushed out of the garden. The, the promise was broken, the covenant torn apart. Then you have Noah, right? And so Noah is there at this time. He's this one faithful person at this time where everyone's doing everything wrong, and God's like, I'm going to destroy it all. You can have a giant boat with, one of each, uh, with two of each of the animals, and I'm going to save you and life, basically. And at the end of that, Noah gets this promise. I'm never going to destroy the world again with a flood. And here's a rainbow so that you'll remember this promise. So anytime we see a rainbow, we can remember that God's not going to just destroy everything with a flood again. That's nice. And then he makes this covenant with... Whoop, got caught there, sorry. And then he makes this covenant with all the people of Israel, Right? And so he starts it with Abraham, giving a, a very specific promise to Abraham, you're going to multiply and you're going to fill the world with your people. And so that was actually a, a promise with no conditions. He said, I'm going to do this for you because you're a person of faith. He renews that promise with Isaac and with Jacob. So we kind of see that this is progressing. But once Moses is around, this promise turns into more of what you would consider another covenant. And God says... I'm going to bless you as long as you're obedient to me, and I will curse you if you're not. And so there's this kind of both sides of it. And, and we kind of see that through the entire Israel story, God's blessing when they're obedient, and then when things go wrong, they're again, they're pushed out of the promised land. Okay, here's the bonus kind of fun uh, one, just kind of interesting. God makes a promise to Cain. We all know Cain is the brother that kills Abel. He's kind of the first, quote-unquote, murderer of the Bible. But God makes a promise to Cain. He says, hey, if anyone does anything like this to you, I'm going to go and curse them even worse than I've cursed you. So he makes this interesting promise because Cain's worried that someone's just going to come and kill him because he's a murderer. So if there's a promise. That's kind of a fun tidbit. Then maybe the most important promise in the Old Testament is the promise to King David. Yes, great, to King David. King David gets this really unique promise that his bloodline 
will sit on the throne forever. That's amazing, right? And David doesn't have any contingencies. God doesn't say, hey, I'm going to do this if you do this, 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 and this. As a matter of fact, David sins, and yet that promise is upheld. So there's this amazing promise that David's going to be the king forever, and that, and that Jerusalem will remain as like this place of power, kind of, sort of, forever. And, and that's an interesting part of it. But so there's this amazing promise. And so I want to just fast forward to the end of the Old Testament and kind of where they go and what they view the promise. And, and even Steve talked about this a bit in uh, Sunday school today. All of a sudden, you have this people who have been exiled in Babylon and then come back to Jerusalem where things are still not exactly right. You know, God isn't in the temple. He's not filling the temple up. And so my question is, when we think about Advent and the very first Advent, what were the Israelites hopeful for? What were they expecting? Now, in the minds of most of the people of that time, the leadership, the kingdom, the the royal line had actually been destroyed. It had been ruined. They went into exile. There was no king anymore. As a matter of fact, they started to have more of what other cultures were doing with their political structure. They had more of like government instead of kingship. So this promise of this amazing royal line with a king that will sit on the throne forever and a kingdom, a promised land that will be blessed forever is, is kind of forgotten. They've forgotten what that all means. And they're, they're looking around and kind of lost, really. And so and, and, uh, the, the Bible project that we watched in Sunday school said it really good. Even after the exile, even after they get back to Jerusalem, it's almost like they're still in exile. They're still lost, and they're still uncertain about what's going to happen next. And so if they were reading their Bibles, they would see throughout all of the prophets, they're all saying exactly what Jeremiah was saying in our, in our uh, scripture today, that, oh no, that root is still there. That plant is still growing. It's, it's still there. But because of an unpreparedness, they're kind of like, no, I'm not, I'm not tracking with that. Here's what John Calvin had to say of of this part of scripture that Jeremiah had given us. He says, here the prophet shows what, what Paul will speak of later, that all the promises of God are in Christ, yes and amen. That is, they do not stand nor can be valid to us except when Christ interposes to sanction or confirm them. Then the efficacy of God's promises, basically the power of God's promises, depend on Christ alone. And hence, the prophets, when speaking of the grace of God, they come at length to Christ, for without him all promises would vanish away. So basically, all of God's promises from Genesis through Kings, through everything, all the way to the end of the Old Testament, are meaningless Because at that point, there was no Jesus. And so there's this huge hole, there's this huge void in the lives of the Israelites at this point, because all the things that God promised seem to not be working out. You'll find one of the greatest amount of other God worship in Israel during this time. It's like the lowest point that the the Israelites are, are in, because they basically are starting to think that God isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to come through. He's not going to get there. So I want to talk a little bit about signs. I, I was talking to Doug McCusker last week, and, and we both had experiences in French Canada, um, in Quebec, Montreal, uh, in that area. And we kind of both talked about how hard it was, neither of us knowing French, to negotiate some things. And then I said, oh, you know what? There was one sign that didn't catch me off guard. It's the sign that said, Aret, and if you're French, maybe you can pronounce that better than me. But this sign that said Aret, I had no problem with. I knew that that word meant stop right when I saw it, because it was on a sign that was an octagon, and it was red. And so I had no trouble with that one sign. However, we and the Israelites have one thing in common, and that's that signs can be very difficult for us. 
Can I ask for a volunteer? Yeah, all right, all right. Oh, and I need a microphone. Uh-oh. There's one right there. Where's the mic? Oh, yeah, awesome. Let's see here. We're going to talk about signs. This is the Chrismon service, and if you didn't know it, this is a Chrismon tree, and we have Chrismon ornaments, and the ornaments are all signs. And so we're going to do a little bit of reading here to see if we can pick up some signs that Christmas is on the way. The first one is the sign of the Epiphany Star. Come here. Here you go. That's for you. Could you read just this bit right here? Now? From now? Yeah, from now. All right. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship with him. Matthew 2, 1 through 2. Do you want me to keep going? No, you're great. Thank you so much. Would you put that on the tree somewhere, anywhere of your liking? So even though the Israelites didn't have signs, they didn't know what they were looking for, and they felt like all was lost, these three wise men who weren't even Israelites saw a star, and they knew that baby Jesus was on his way. That's interesting. Can I have another volunteer? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, I'm very convinced that this is not the right ornament, but we're going to just pretend that it is. The Christmas rose, and it goes on to the next page. Here you go. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. Isaiah 35, 1 to 2. Thank you. That's for you. Can you hang that, please? Yeah, okay. Did that catch, Bert? I'm just going to read that one one more time uh, so that we all hear it. The Christmas rose, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. Isaiah 35, 1 through 2. So again, the Israelites seem lost. They don't seem to see anything that's pointing to any kind of Messiah. And yet there's a rose that will blossom in the desert. And that will tell us of the abundance that is to come. Another volunteer, please. All right, Jim, thank you. Here you go. This is for you. Why, thank you. You're welcome. And if you could read this paragraph here. The manger. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be enrolled with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while while they were there, the time came for her to be delivered. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Luke 2, 1-7. Thank you. Can you please put that on the tree anywhere you like? So again, the Israelites were lost. They had no idea what was going on. But in the town of Bethlehem, literally the town where David came from, this amazing thing is about to happen. One more volunteer, please. Come on, don't be shy. Yeah, come on up, please. angel and in that region 
there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was a, with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is well pleased. Luke 2, 8 through 14. Thank you so much. Would you go put that anywhere on the tree you'd like? So the uh, shepherds who are Israelites, they need a bigger sign than, than some other people do. So they get not only just one angel, but a whole multitude of angels in the sky. They need like the big Vegas neon sign saying, hey, something's about to happen. You should check it out. And they even get exactly where it'll happen. And so those are some signs that, that Advent is happening, that Jesus is coming. Now I have a, a song for us today. I, I hope you all can... Do you all know the song this time of year when Christmas is near? Do you all know that song? No, not too much. Okay, I'm going to sing a little bit. No, I'm not going to sing. I'm going to just... <laughs> you, you don't want that. I might, I'm off. So this time of year when Christmas is near goes a little something like this. It says, little girls and little boys dream of worlds full of toys this time of the year when Christmas is near. Evergreens are snowy white. Sleigh bells ring through the night this time of the year when Christmas is near. And somewhere near a steeple, people kneel and pray and choirs sing carols of Christmas Day Santa Claus is on his way, loads of joy on his sleigh, this time of the year when Christmas is near. And so we have these, these two kind of separate things happening. We have, we have preparation for Advent. We have an epiphany star in the sky. We have angels going crazy and singing songs. And yet we're also looking around for, for Santa up in the sky, and we hear Christmas carols being sung. We have a manger in a, in a barn or, or maybe even in a cave, and yet we have this big store window that we can all imagine filled with toys, right? We have these two things happening at the same time. I'm a little Christmas cynical, so I'm going to talk about some other signs that I've, I've been noticing. Uh, the day after Halloween ends, magically, everything changes from pumpkins and costumes to candy canes and Christmas trees and ornaments. Um, we have amazing days to celebrate, like Black Friday. I hope you all celebrated that just uh, two days ago. And then tomorrow, Cyber Monday. So we've got some things to celebrate. I noticed all the gas prices went up because we're traveling, so might as well do that. I'm even wearing a big sign today. I, I wore this on purpose today. I've got my ugly Christmas sweater on. I'm, I'm ready, right? Um, the elf on the shelf is sitting around places, right? We could see him. Uh, <laughs> but in Luke 21, we're given some very different signs, some pretty hard signs to, to reckon with. I wanted to talk about the second coming a little bit today because that's actually where we are. Even though we have this time of thinking about Jesus as a baby coming back again. I'm off? Yeah, but, all right. How's this? Whoa. All right. We'll, we'll try this. You know, this is a great church family because you all can help out when things aren't, aren't working right. <laughs> Thanks so much. So anyway, we're actually in this time 
of expecting baby Jesus, but we're also in this time, kind of at the same time, expecting Jesus to come again. And those signs are amazing. The sun, the moon, and the stars are going to start doing some different things that really catch our attention. The sea and the waves and the roar of everything is confusing us. It's, it's powerful. Nations, whole entire nations will be under distress. Some of this might be happening already. Um, fear and foreboding so great that people will faint over fear. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. So it's not even just earth that's kind of getting bu buzzed up. It's the entire universe. All of creation is acting like a big alarm clock in this verse, in, in these verses. How different from the coming of a baby, right? You know, a, a baby comes, and, and one thing we definitely know is mom is, mom is in pain. There's, there's yelling, maybe even a little bit of cursing. It's really painful. And then a baby comes and you hear this little crying. It's very intimate. It's just like right in one maybe room or, or in Jesus' case, in a barn or a cave. And yet that's so different from this idea of the second coming where literally the entire universe is in upheaval. It's all under distress. And yet Jesus tells us to lift our heads up high for redemption. Now, this is coming straight out of the book of Malachi, where Malachi says, who can stand before the Son of Man? And the way he's saying it, the, the, the way that the Hebrew is, is done, it almost seems like no one can. That's what Malachi is really saying. He's saying, who can stand before the Son of Man? And he knows that no one can. And yet Jesus is saying this in a totally different way, where he's saying, we all can Everybody can stand in front of the Son of Man. And not only can you stand in front of him, but your head can be lifted up high for redemption. He tells this parable of the fig tree, where basically he's saying that all life is acting as a warning system. Okay, Everything out there, we, we just got some beautiful new trees on this side over here. Everything outside of our of our comfort zone out there in the world can tell us what's happening next. We know when summer's coming. We know when winter's coming, right? There's not a leaf left on the tree by the time winter comes. We got a little dusting of snow this morning at our house. I don't know if y'all did, but hey, winter's coming. We know because creation is telling us. And Jesus is using this little parable to say the same thing. He's saying, we're going to know when Jesus is coming back again. We're not going to be like, oh, I didn't realize. No, all of creation is going to be in upheaval. We're going to know. And we're going to know not that we should be afraid or, or worried or anxious about it, but we're going to know that the kingdom is near. So in this room today and, and at home on Facebook, what are we waiting for? Are we waiting or are we preparing what are we hopeful for? In the Sunday school, we, we talked about the, uh, what's the series? I already forgot the name of it. The, the Left Behind series, right? And, and I kind of said, like, you know, it, the, that's a great book series, but it's, it is kind of like a mix of theology and fiction. Is that going to help us to hope for something, or is it going to kind of give us a little bit of, oof, I'm a little anxious now? Both of our scriptures end with some good news here. And so I want to just kind of reiterate the good news that's given at the end of both scriptures. At the very end of the chapter of Jeremiah that we were reading, it says this. It says, for I will restore their fortunes and I will have mercy upon them. And at the end of the Luke chapter, it says this. It says, be alert at all times, praying that you may have the strength to escape all these things that will take place to stand before the Son of Man. And so we're given this, this kind of good glimpse, okay? When we think about the second coming, I think sometimes we're worried. We're like, you know, like, I think even someone said, like, well, what if he was walking down the road right now? <laughs> like, what would that feel like? And you're like, would it be apprehensive or would it be exciting? For us in this room, it should be really exciting. And so I want to ask this question, what are we hearing? Okay, 
The kingdom is here because Jesus has come. But the kingdom is not yet here because Jesus is returning. We're kind of stuck in this weird middle place. Uh, as an anthropologist, I wrote a paper about liminality. And, and liminality is this idea that you're in between phases, okay? And what I wrote about was specifically the, the balance between being a child and being an adult, okay? There's this place in between, right? Some of you have experienced, actually probably everybody in this room has experienced that in between space where you're, you're not a kid anymore, you know, but you're not really an adult yet. You don't have your own insurance, probably. <laughs> and that's the same place that we've been stuck in for about 2,000-ish years, this place of like not exactly there yet. And we can all feel it, right? We can look around and we can say, hey, the world has gotten worse. Things have gotten bad. It's not so bad that like I think the whole earth is going to implode in a minute, but it, it seems worse than maybe some other time. We're in this weird kind of, where are we? And so of course we're lost because we don't know. We're not exactly there yet. So do we act like we're there? I think is the question. Are we exactly Christ-like? No, we're not perfect yet, but we're working on it, right? We're kind of working on it. We're being transformed. We're in that process of, of maybe metamorphosis. Maybe this is the chrysalis. I, I just came up with that. I don't know if that fits, but, but maybe we're in this place where we're kind of working on getting better. And we're all in this place, right? We're kind of all in this together. None of us are perfect yet. So what can we do? As, as members of St. James, we're always looking for the do thing. And I think the do thing in this, in this chapter is very specific. We're meant to be prepared. And so if you're the type of person who likes to take notes, this would be the time to, to get out a pen or a piece of paper. But I have seven ideas of preparation that I'd like to share with you to, to kind of close us, okay? In Luke chapter 19, it talks about Jesus telling his people to continue his business while he's gone, okay? If, you, if you've ever been a, a business person or in a business and then the supervisor, the owner had to go on vacation, his, his or her hope is that you're going to be there and the business will be there when they return. And, and Jesus is saying the same thing. He's saying, carry on my business. Well, what was Jesus' business? Jesus' business was healing people. His business was educating people. His business was loving people. His business was anointing people, just like we talked about last week. So carry on his business. And we're meant to continue to do that even today. Be about his business. Mark chapter 13 has two things for us. First, it says, do not be deceived. Okay, Jesus talks about, there's going to be a lot of people saying, I'm Jesus. People are going to show up and say, hey, you remember the second coming? That's me. And Jesus says, be very careful. And that's why he gives these warning signs. If you haven't seen these warning signs, but someone shows up and says, I'm Jesus, do not be deceived. Or if someone says he's a prophet of Jesus, but nothing that they're saying is in line with the Bible, do not be deceived. Mark 13 also says, do not speculate which we do a lot of. We, we talked about this in Sunday school too. You know, The end of the world wasn't 1972. It wasn't 2011 or, or whatever the Mayan calendar said. It, you know, we can't speculate these things. Jesus even says, I don't even know the exact time. Only my father does. So do not speculate. It's Advent week number one, so I've got to say that we need to have hope, right? That's what this week is all about. It's about having hope. Brett and Megan let, lit the hope candle. So have hope. And if your hope is under pressure, ask people for help with that. If your hope is under attack, pray about it. Our hope should only be growing at this point. We should only be even more hopeful. But there are times, and I'm sure all of us can relate to this, where hope goes on a downward scale. And so that brings me to my next one, encourage one another. We're a great little family here, but if 
One day, Randy's like, you know, my hope is actually really low. I'm, I'm not feeling that, that great about Jesus and, and these things. The only thing we could do is come around and, and encourage that, encourage him. But to also realize that we all go down that, that hill sometimes. I don't think, you know, any of us are uh, free of that. Then, uh, kind, of, kind of like doing a what if. What if today is, is the day? How do you want to act today? You know, um, New Year's resolutions are right around the corner, but, but that's kind of a little silly, right? We can be the person that we ought to be today. We don't have to wait. And that's hard. It's hard to do that, but, but why not do it today? And then finally, and, and this is probably the most important one, preach the gospel to all nations. Uh, Stephen brought us to a wonderful part of uh, Saint P- uh, of Peter, uh, his second letter, where it says, it basically says, "Hey, I'm going slow. I'm I'm heading towards the end, to the coming again, slowly, and I'm doing that so that maybe no one would perish." And what I heard from that, what I was like, "Oh man, what's huge about that is." What he's basically saying is, hey, continue to go out and preach the gospel and share it with as many people as possible so that maybe no one would perish. And so our greatest do is to continue doing what Jesus told us to do from day one. Go out and make disciples. You know, we, we have this lovely family, but the, we can continue to go out and share this news with everyone. This is probably the greatest do that there is in the Bible, right? You know, and, and I, I love thinking about how we want to be doers, but we don't even have to search the Bible. Like God gives us this great command to go out, to seek others. And so that's our, our greatest passion should be for this. So those are seven things. Keep doing Jesus' business Do not be deceived by people who pretend to be something they're not. Do not speculate about when this day will come. It's going to come with a great cacophony of the whole creation warning us. So don't speculate about it. Continue to hope, or even if we can, increase our hope. And when we see people who are seeming hopeless, encourage them. Act as if today is the day. And then finally, and most importantly, let's go out and preach the gospel to all people in all corners of the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for even the mysterious part of the word. As, uh, as Presbyterians, sometimes we feel like we're going to know every single bit of the Bible and understand it with completeness. And Lord, actually, we should cherish and lift up your mystery. We don't know when the day is that you will come again. But as we begin this Advent season, we can look and see to when you came to us the first time. Lord, help us to look for signs to sense them. Help us to show each other those signs when we see them. But Lord, most of all, help us to follow in your footsteps, to be Christ-like, and to act as anointed ones. In your name I pray. Amen. Please stand in body and spirit or spirit for hymn number 555. Now thank we all our God.
now for our affirmation of faith. This is from Reverend Rebecca Harrison at a Spanish Springs Presbyterian in Nevada. We are an Advent people, a people of hope. For us, Advent is a time of waiting, and so we wait. We wait for the coming of the one who is the fulfillment of God's promise, the fulfillment of hope, the declaration that we have been redeemed. Even so, we are not a naive people. We know that the world in which we live will continue to be filled with pain and sorrow. We know that hatred and violence will continue to exist. We know that death and separation will continue to be a part of our lives. But because we are an Advent people, we know that none of these things will win in the end. The Holy One is coming to make holy once again all that was, is, and ever will be. And in our waiting and hoping, we work in worship, pray and play, in all things hoping that peace, love, and joy will reign in our lives and in our world, now and forever. Amen. And now for the offering of the people. Let us pray. Lord, in your abundance, you give to us freely. You bless us in ways in which sometimes we don't even realize. But Lord, I am always touched by the generous heart of this church who truly loves their family in ways that you have taught us. So Lord, I lift up the plate that is filled with love and pray over it as we give it back to you. In your name we pray, amen. Now for the prayers of the people, which will end with the Lord's Prayer. Lord, today starts a day of hope Lord, we remain incredibly hopeful for so many people who we know who are sick right now. I specifically want to lift up Jean McCusker. Lord, you continue to be with her. You continue to shower her with blessings of positivity. And you continue to be with Doug in strength and meaning. Lord, help us to help them, but also... Help us to know how much you love them every single day. We also lift up Melissa Shunk, who's still uh, recovering at home right now. Lord, continue to heal her. Continue to help her to grow day by day. And Lord, uh, we ask that you please be with Bruce and Debbie Dennis as they continue the hard work of, of grief, but also the hard work that comes with the death of a family member, Lord. Be with them in this time, we ask you, please. Lord, I also want to lift up Wilson College and specifically Derek Waddlington, the chaplain there, and also David True, the associate professor of religion. Be with them as they continue to strengthen the ministry at Wilson College uh, and continue to show them how much you love them in the way that they pursue your work in that space. Lord, I want to lift up the Reverend Bill Hambright, who passed away this past week. He was the pastor at Center Presbyterian in Louisville. Lord, in, in his absence, I just ask that you continue to fill that church with your spirit and that you continue to love and support Roxanne and her family. And finally, Lord, I want to lift up once again Bev Paulus. I just ask that you continue to be with her whole family and with this church as we just enter into the grieving process, Lord. I am so excited by a time where you will come and remove a tear or all tears from all people. But in this moment, Lord, we have many tears for Bev and the amazing ministry that she had in this church as part of our big family. Lord, I lift up all these people and others that I don't even know about to you, Lord, 
hear all our prayers in this moment and continue to help us as we continue to think about the presence of Jesus in our lives and the way in which he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Please stand as, oh, you're all standing. <laughs> Here's our last song, Spirit Song. may be seated. And now just for a time of our life together, I want to tell you some things that are happening. Uh, today, right after service, um, my whole family was supposed to come, but my whole family is dealing with the, the lovely things that come with the common cold. Um, but I will be going to uh, um, Pizza Boy for lunch, and then I'm going to go over to Harrisburg and do a mural walk. Y'all are welcome to come with me. I know it's chilly out, uh, so it might not be the ideal day to do it, but I'm, I'm excited for it. So if you want to, just come on along, and there's uh, these handy-dandy maps right at the front d desk. So uh, if you can't come today and you want to look at some of the graffiti art that's out there, this has all 60-something of them. I will not be seeing 60 of them today, but, but we'll see some. We'll see some. Um, next week, uh, I'm, I'm giving myself a shout out, I guess. Next week is um, my ordination and installation. Uh, thank you, yeah. So it'll be uh, next Sunday at 1.30. We're going to be having uh, lunch before the service at 11.30 in the gym. So if you just... Just love being here. We're going to be here. We'll have church. We'll have lunch. We'll have an ordination. Maybe something afterwards. Who knows? It'll be a, a big, good time. If you're an extrovert, you're going to be super excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, a mission update, so the next mobile mission date is uh, Saturday, December 4th, so that's the day before um, the installation. And so you'll meet here at the church at 6.15 p.m., and if you have any questions or anything, Randy would be a great person to talk to. Um, and then also, S Steve Grubb, oh, I think I lost it. Uh, Steve uh, has given us some great devotionals to go with our Advent season. They're also at the front table right by the door. So if you want to grab one of those, you can grab one. And I think we sent it electronically as well. So that'll be a great way to uh, continue uh, to be thinking about Advent this week and, and into the coming weeks. Let's see, anything else? I feel like I'm on a roll here. I think that's it. Those are the announcements. And so... Uh, let me go ahead and give us a charge and benediction. Lord, I think the most important thing that we might have heard today is that this first week of Advent is a time to be hopeful. And so, Lord, as we leave these doors, I hope we leave with an energy that is full of hope, with a heart that's full of hope. And so when we go and think about talking to other people about you and spreading your gospel message, we might spread a message that starts with hope. Lord, I hope that we go into this week with a heart that's full and hands that are ready to get to work and a heart that's ready to meet new people and tell them a little bit about who you are. Amen.